in the book of Matthew chapter 9, verse 20 to 22, and I'm going to read these three passages of scriptures here at the beginning, and then we'll look at some individually, but what I want to speak on tonight is downcast but not defeated. This story that is recorded in the book of Matthew, it's recorded in the book of Mark, it's recorded in the book of Luke, all three uh, of the uh, synoptic gospels record this song about this particular woman. Notice, if you will, in Matthew chapter 9, verses 20 to 22, it says, And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood, uh, 12 years came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, If I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. But Jesus turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. And then over in Luke's gospel, Mark's gospel, chapter 5, verses 25 to 34, we read uh, the following. And a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind, and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And he looked around about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. And then over in Luke's gospel, chapter 8, verses 43 to 48, Luke records, And a woman having an issue of blood twelve years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him, touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood Stanched. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude throng thee and press thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And Jesus said, Somebody hath touched me, for I perceive that virtue has gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared unto him before all the people, for what cause she had touched him, and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. Father God, as we pause tonight, we pause this evening as we look over this New Testament passage of Scripture, we see, O oh God, many truths that, that uh, are gleaned here in this field of scripture. I pray tonight as we look at this particular issue, this particular problem that this woman had. Her world had collapsed around her. Life had caved in upon her. and She felt downcast. She felt defeated in life. And yet she knew that if she could just touch even the hem of the gar of garment of Jesus, her faith was that strong that she believed in her heart that Jesus would touch her and heal her through just the touch of those tassels that hung from the garment that he wore. Father, help us to see this incredible faith because faith truly is the victory that overcomes the world. Father, bless us, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. In the book of Matthew chapter 9 and verse 20, uh, we just read, And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood, twelve years came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. Chapter 14, verse 36. 
and besought him that they might only touch the hem of his garment, and as many as touched were made perfectly whole. There are several things tonight about this story that I want us to look at. Here's a woman, she's diseased in her body. When I think about all of the people all over the world tonight that are struggling, the people tonight that are all over the world, when I think about places like uh, M.D. Anderson in Houston, when I think about Sloan Kettering in New York, When I think about Mayo's and when I think about the Cancer Centers of America, uh, strategically located throughout the United States, when I think about St. Jude Children's Hospital, I thought just this afternoon, you know, of all the gifts that God has given to people, the many, many gifts that people have, as many times as I've walked the halls of hospitals, as many times as I've walked uh, the halls of nursing homes, If I could ask for one gift, it would be the gift of healing. To see humanity who is diseased, who is not only conflicted mentally many people with mental illnesses that we see repeatedly over and over in our world today. And we see the many, many, many drugs that are out there on the market that people are taking. I thought to myself, here is a woman, she's downcast. She's depleted all of her financial resources, and she is none the better, according to what the Scripture has to say. She's gone from doctor to doctor. She's tried every cure. She tried every remedy that was out there during her day. It's really interesting if you go back and you look and you read some of the remedies in that day and time that people used for everything imaginable that happened to them. It's really kind of uh, uh, mind uh, provoking to read some of the various remedies that are out there. I can remember my grandmother on my mother's side, she was a school teacher for 36 years. She had taught in various schools, not only in Kentucky, but here in Oklahoma. And as she grew up as a young girl, she grew up on her father's tobacco farm there in Kentucky. And uh, she and her five brothers, as they worked the fields, and then as she became uh, the age that she was in her 70s and in her 80s, and, and her skin, the skin cancers that uh, she would have, and she would go to the dermatologist to have those things burn off or, or cut out or removed. And, and uh, I was thinking just the other day that... Uh, Uh, One of the uh, remedies that she saw when she was growing up as a girl in Kentucky, her father had what she called a rose cancer on his face, on his cheek. And uh, someone told him if he would go out into his yard and get some sheep shawl, if you know what that is, like the clover-looking little leaf, and take and bruise that up in a rag and make what the old folks called a poultice, and put on their face. He did that. My grandmother said as a girl, she remembered her father walking the floor all night long because that was drawing. The next morning when he went in to shave and he took that bandage off, that cancer fell out of his face like, with, like a spider. And uh, my grandmother used to do that, and I've seen her take places off of her hands and she would tell her dermatologist about it, and you know, of course, they acted interested, but uh, they didn't believe in that. But they would listen to her because none the wiser she was going to tell them anyway. And uh, what they couldn't take off, she would, or try to anyway. I could not help but think about this woman in Scripture tonight. She used every remedy that was known to humanity during the days of her life. And for 12 long years, she struggled with the disease. She had spent all the money that she had made, that she had saved, that she had earned, that she had kept. And she went from one doctor to another trying to find something that would bring healing to her body. It says in Luke chapter 8, verse 43, the first part, and a woman having an issue of blood 12 years. And so here's this woman. She faces this serious issue. It's gripped her body. 
and for 12 years, there seemed absolutely to be no hope no cure in sight. That phrase there in the King James, and that's what I read from tonight, issue of blood, it's used in all three accounts in both Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and it means a flowing issue. The word literally comes from flowing like a stream. Now, we can't be totally for sure where she's hemorrhaging from, but we can be sure of one thing, that she's dealt with this issue for 12 long years. In fact, Mark chapter 5, 29 identifies this blood issue. Mark calls it a plague. Notice in verse 29, and straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. Uh, Mark 5, 34, and he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. That word plague there is used only a few times in Scripture. And in two of those uh, other incidences, the, the, the word plague is mentioned right before those that had unclean spirits or evil spirits and other infirmities. This word plague, it comes from a Greek word. And in four of its New Testament usages, it means plague. And in two of them, it means a scourging, a whip or a scourge or a plague, a calamity or a misfortune that was sent from God to discipline or to punish. In the Old Testament, we find that God often scourged the nation of Israel. He placed them in situations where they would um, get his whipping, a calamity to discipline them for their sinfulness and their backsliding. If you go back over to 1 Kings chapter 12 and verse 11, and now whereas my father did laid you with a heavy yoke. I will add to your yoke. My father has chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. Then Mark 3.10, for he had healed many in so much that they pressed upon him for to touch him as many as had plagues. Luke 7.21, and in that same hour he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits, and unto many that were blind he gave sight. Now it appears in the narrative of these synoptic gospels that this woman has received this plague due, it seems that perhaps God has sent this to her. Uh, we know that sin is the ultimate uh, root cause of the degradation of man and of nature, but personally, God still chastises according to our own needs. Now, this should cause pause for you and me to ponder the results of our sinfulness. You see, God can strike blows to us that are beyond medical healing, beyond intellectual help. And this woman, she's desperate. She's chasing after medical solutions when in reality, her own relief would come through divine intervention. If you can only imagine the anxiety that she's gone through for 12 years, the intensity of the emotional and the mental stress that has been on her, notwithstanding uh, the physical part that has affected her health. And in this story, she interrupts Jesus. He's on his way, by the way, to uh, heal the 12-year-old daughter of a man named uh, Jairus. But as the woman interrupts Jesus' proceedings, Jairus' daughter dies. She's just a girl of 12 years old. And one girl dies, and one woman that is plagued with an other issue, a blood issue, is interrupting Jesus for healing. The number 12 is a familiar number in the Bible. If you will remember, there were the 12 tribes of Israel. There are the 12 apostles. There are the 12 gates in Jerusalem. There are the 12 types of precious stones. Uh, in the book of Revelation, we see the woman that wore 12 crowns. Speaking of Israel, we see the tree that bore 12 manner of fruit. We see Ishmael, Isaac's brother, the firstborn of Abraham. Ishmael had uh, 12 sons. Uh, then we see 12 priests found in the book of Chronicles. 
The altar of Elijah had 12 stones. There were 12 loaves found on the golden table. There were 12 spies that went out to spy out uh, the land of Canaan. There were 12 springs found in Elam. The cloak of Ahijah was stripped into 12 pieces. There were 12 stones that were placed in the Jordan River in order to be a reminder of what God did. And on and on the list goes. The number 12 denotes setting things in proper order or some form of governmental structural perfection. And Jesus, what he's doing here, he's going to set some things in perfect order. Here in the daughter of, uh, here in the the 12-year-old girl of Jairus' daughter and with this other lady who has suffered not only uh, with this disease, but it's been for 12 years. So you've got one woman that is interrupting Jesus' journey to go to a 12-year-old girl, and this woman who has this issue of blood disease for 12 years, Jesus is on his way. Jairus' daughter has died, so Jesus is going to resurrect one from the dead. He's going to restore one from disease And he shows his power, how that he sets things in order, how he restores things that are needed. This woman would have been labeled in her day as being unclean. She was not even supposed to be out in public. Anyone that came with any close proximity to this woman would be considered unclean. It was a serious matter. It affected her religious status. And it would have involved uh, contact with anyone that she was around. She would have been isolated. She would have been hopelessly a pariah or an outcast out there. Notice if you go back to the book of Leviticus chapter 15 verse 19, we see, and if a woman have an issue and her issue in her flesh be blood, she shall be put apart seven days and whosoever toucheth her shall be unclean until the even. Notice in Leviticus 15, 25, Moses writes again, uh, And if a woman have an issue of her blood many days out of the time of her separation, she shall be unclean. Notice how that speaks about that. In verse 26 of Leviticus 15, Every bed whereon she lieth all the days of her issue shall be unto her as the bed of her separation. Whatsoever she sitteth upon shall be unclean as the uncleanness of her separation. Leviticus 15, 27, And whosoever toucheth those things shall be unclean and shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the even. So first of all, in the narrative of these three Gospels, we see the woman and her disease. Secondly, tonight, we see the woman and her dilemma. Notice in Mark chapter 5, verse 26, and she noticed she suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had, and get this, and was nothing bettered but grew worse. Nothing bettered but grew worse. Do you know anybody like that? Have you had anybody in your family like that? You know, I thought about my mother as I read this story when she uh, was discovered with cancer at age 50. She had gone to MD Anderson. She came back. She had been in Oklahoma City to doctors. She had been to MD Anderson to doctors. She had been to Wichita Falls, Texas to one of uh, the best specialists at that time out of Sloan Kettering in New York City. For four years, she thought she was fine. And then her cancer reoccurred, and she battled it for two more years and died at the age of 56. Let me tell you, she went where she could. I can remember the medical bills that mounted up and all of the things that go along with the stressors of that mentally. And uh, I could not help but think about this lady. She had spent all of her living upon doctors, but none of them could heal Uh, what she had going on in her life. This woman is not only ill, she's searching, she's looking, she is uh, trying everything in the world that is humanly possible to take care of this problem. Her spending's depleted. The text says she spent all. And this word comes 
from the Greek word the, the panio, meaning to incur an expense, extend, or to spend, or in a bad sense, to squander, to waste, or to consume. You see the tragedy not only of her disease here, but the depletion of her financial resources causes us to realize she had basically squandered and wasted her money. In some regards, think about that. She could not be healed. She could not be touched. The only way was if she could reach out and touch the hem of the garment of Jesus Christ. Notice in the King James the phrase, no better off, literally means that nothing she had tried had assisted her, nor was advantageous to her or profited her in spending all of her resources and trying all of the meaningless potions of that day and snake remedies and all of the things in her day. There was absolutely none of those that benefited her in the least. When I think of my mother and I think of the days of going through chemo and and all of those kinds of things and to realize that the cancer is not what killed my mother. It was the results of the chemotherapy that killed her because it increased her heart. Uh, it enlarged her heart, which created uh, congestive heart failure, and they could not keep the fluid off. And so in trying to find a cure and trying to find a remedy, uh, all that she did in the end wound up to no avail. In reality, according to Scripture, the word rather there implies to a greater degree or by far grew worse. And that's what happened. That word worse has a meaning of entrance, which literally means as if a demon had entered into someone. It can also mean towards. But in this woman's case, the more money she uh, poured out upon her illness, the more hopeless and helpless she became. And in the end, she was to a greater degree sicker than she was when it had first begun. The condition grew worse and she entered into something that was beyond human control. I'm not saying that this woman was possessed by a demon, but I'm saying that she had entered into a realm of her illness that was beyond human healing. And the more that men tried the worse this woman would become. She's in a grave dilemma. Help is beyond her control. And this message tonight, I think, speaks to many people that cannot seem to help themselves. And the more they try, the worse off they become. And the woman had passed into a condition worse than it had been once it had begun. Things were much worse. There's a third thing here that I see in this story the woman and her decision. In Mark 9, 20, And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood 12 years came behind Jesus and touched the hem of Jesus' garment. Mark 5, 27, When she heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. Notice her incredible face. She's tried everything in the world. So oftentimes, have you ever noticed when we're in a dilemma, Whatever the dilemma may be, whether it's medical, whether it's uh, something of, of financial nature, whether it's something of, a, of some other uh, nature in our life, we try all of the sources and then we try Jesus. Have you ever noticed how that happens? Oftentimes, in the book of Luke chapter 8 verse 44 says, she came behind him, she touched the border of his garment and immediately, notice immediately, I'm always amused and amazed through the years as I have watched various people that claim to be faith healers. And, uh, you know, I've watched people through the years and wonder why that if uh, when they were touched, they were not immediately healed. When Jesus did something, it was immediate. It happened. And... Uh, Immediately when she came and touched the border of his garment, this issue of blood disease, it was gone. And I want you to look at this famous testimony that drew her to this man called Jesus. That if she could just get to him and she could touch the hem of his garment. Mark 5, 27 says, when she had heard of Jesus. 
are you telling people about Jesus tonight? Are you and I telling the world about Jesus tonight? You see, he's the most important figure that has ever, ever invaded planet Earth. And I want you to know tonight, there are many people in this world that need to hear about Jesus. But unfortunately, because Satan has blinded the eyes and deafened the ears and hardened the hearts of people out there, they turn a deaf ear. When she heard of Jesus, she obviously had heard about this man called Jesus because Jesus is, had healed a man with an unclean spirit in the book of Mark. Jesus had healed Peter's mother-in-law of a great fever that she had in Mark chapter 1. Jesus had healed multitudes in Capernaum in the book of Mark chapter 1, 32 and 34. He had cast out devils throughout Galilee in the book of Mark 39. Uh, he had healed a leper in Mark chapter 1, verse 40 to 42. His fame was overwhelming according to the book of Mark. He had healed a man with palsy. He had healed throngs of people out there. Jesus had calmed the raging sea. Jesus had healed the demoniac man. He had healed a man uh, uh, out there in the area of the Decapolis. Uh, uh, and so Jesus, this miracle mighty man, this great physician, let me tell you, he had abilities that no other earthly physician had and she was in search she was in search of this after she heard of the healing powers and of these special abilities this woman for the first time in 12 years had a flicker of hope that welled up inside of her and her spirit was renewed and she began to look and to search and to get into the crowd, even though she would have been an outcast in that day. Our text says that after she had heard, then she came into the crowd from behind Jesus. Notice how she positions herself to touch this mighty man. If Jesus could do it for all of the others that she had heard about, then surely he could do it for her. In Mark 5, 27 we see the phrase, and touched his garment. She literally stopped Jesus in his tracks. He's on his way to heal a 12-year-old girl. And this one stops Jesus in his track. She didn't touch his, just touch his garment. She clings to it. Let me tell you, it's a profound portrait of faith. And her touch is recorded, as I mentioned earlier, in all three of the various Gospels where she reaches out and she touches the hem of his garment. And so tonight, we see her disease. We see her dilemma. We see her decision. She decided after she had spent all that she would try this man called Jesus I love the song, Have You Met the Man of Galilee? He claims to be the Son of God. Jill, I want you to have Toby to get that track and sing that for me one of these days. Uh, have you met the man of Galilee who claims to be the Son of God? That word, him, notice is used five times over in the New Testament. And in all three of these gospel accounts, it uses different phrases, but it ultimately means the same things. It can mean edge or margin or the fringe of a garment. Or in the New Testament, uh, it can mean a little appendage that's hanging down from the edge of a cloak, an outer garment made of twisted wool, this tassel or this tuft that the Jews, they attached it to their mantles, their outward cloak, to remind them of the law of God. In the book of Numbers, chapter 15, verse 37, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, notice in verse 38, speak unto the children of Israel and bid them that they make their fringes in the borders of their garments 
throughout their generations and that they put upon the fringe that's the tassel that she clung to notice the borders of a ribbon of blue notice in verse 39 and it shall be unto you for a fringe that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them and that you seek not after your own heart and your own eyes after which ye used to go a whoring verse 40 that you may remember and do all my commandments and be holy under your God verse 41 I am the Lord your God which brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God I am the Lord your God now according to the Jewish law in the book of Numbers, chapter 15, as well as in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 22, every Jew was required to wear a fringe or tassel at each of the four corners of this outer cloak or garment. Each thread was to be a deep blue. Now, these tassels were to be a constant reminder to the Jews of the commandments of God and their duty to keep them, and the blessings of healing and of salvation if they did. These tassels that this lady clung to on Jesus, these tassels were tied into 613 knots to constantly remind them of the 613 laws of Moses of which there were 365 that were prohibitions that said thou shalt not, and there were 248 affirmations of thou shall laws. And so the tassels were vitally important on the garment. And she thought, if I can just get to Jesus, if I can just get to him and touch the hem of his garment, I know that I can be made whole. Mark chapter 5, Matthew 9, 21 says, For she said within herself, If I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. Mark 5, 28, For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. Luke 8, 47, And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before Jesus. She declared unto Jesus before all the people for what cause she had touched Jesus and how she was healed immediately. Matthew 9, 22, but Jesus turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. Notice the woman and her deliverance. Twelve long years she struggled with this disease, bleeding, hemorrhaging. I can't even begin to imagine Mark's gospel in chapter 5, verse 29 says, In straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. Luke 8, 44, came behind him and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood stenched. You see, the text says that when she got to Jesus, the great physician, she reached out by faith. She believed with all of her heart. If I can but touch the hem of his garment, I can be freed. And after 12 long years, now she is totally healed, totally alive. Jesus would go on and raise that 12-year-old from the dead, Jairus' daughter. You know, we sing that song, Oh, Hallelujah, What a Savior. He gave his life's blood for even me. You know, down through the years, I've prayed for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. I've stood at, stood at countless bedsides, held hands of people that were dying of various illnesses, people that were sick with various things. I've been in and out of rooms through the years of very, very contagious uh, things that people had and just prayed for my own protection while I was there, but I've learned this through the years. God has a grand purpose. God has a grand plan in the lives and the hearts of people. Sometimes he heals from a distance. Sometimes he uses doctors and medicine to bring healing 
in people's lives. Sometimes he doesn't use either. He just takes them out of this world and heals them completely to be in his presence. And after I'd claimed every promise in God's word, every scripture of healing and prayed for my mother for six solid years, every single day of my life, I claimed those promises for healing. God answered my prayer. He just didn't answer it the way I prayed. He did divinely heal her, but he healed her completely where she stands tonight in his presence more alive than I can ever even begin to imagine. Let me tell you, the touch of the master's hand, whether he says yes, whether he says through medicine, whether he says, no, I've got a greater purpose, I'm bringing you into my presence. Let me tell you, he is the master. He is the great physician who does heal all by diseases. That means that one of these days, all of the diseases of this world will no longer be. There will be no reason for doctors. There will be no reason for prescriptions someday. There will be no reason for wheelchairs and walkers and canes and hip surgeries and knee replacements and shoulder replacements. Aren't you grateful that someday there'll be no need for any of that? Uh, there'll be no need to have preachers. Oh, won't you be grateful someday? Well, I'm grateful to know that when I read this wonderful story in all three of these synoptic gospels, it relates today just as much as it related back then. Would you stand as we pray together this evening?